Nearly 60 years after her death, Marilyn Monroe's face remains one of the most recognizable in Hollywood. But things were not easy for Monroe, as the actress experienced a great deal of tragedy during her relatively short life. This is the tragic real-life story of Marilyn Monroe. The woman the world recognizes as Marilyn Monroe was born Norma Jean Mortensen on June 1, 1926 and baptized Norma Jean Baker. Monroe never knew who her father was. In her unfinished memoir, My Story, she wrote that her mother had a picture of a man who looked like actor Clark Gable, but wouldn't tell her daughter his name. Subsequently, whenever Monroe thought of her father, she pictured Gable, whom she even starred opposite in her final movie, The Misfits. Meanwhile, Monroe's mother, Gladys Baker, experienced a number of mental health issues over the course of her life. Within two weeks of Monroe's birth, Baker had put her in the care of foster parents. Baker would be in and out of mental health institutions all her life and wouldn't re-establish a relationship with her daughter for many years to come. After Gladys Baker was taken to an institution for the first time, Monroe lived with her mother's former lodgers and then with neighbors who offered to legally adopt her. Baker, however, refused to let this happen. Monroe next went to live with Baker's best friend, Grace McKee, but in 1935, McKee could no longer afford to care for her and took her to the Los Angeles Orphans Home Society. Here, Monroe was nothing less than miserable. Two years later, McKee, now married, took Monroe back to live with her and new husband, Doc Goddard. Soon after, the Goddards also put Monroe in foster care. At the time, being a foster parent was seen more as a money-making scheme than an act of compassion. During her childhood, Monroe lived with 12 different families, many of whom were neglectful or abusive. Monroe later said she was sexually assaulted by a lodger in one of the homes and developed a stutter as a result of the trauma. After all this, the Goddards eventually took Monroe back, but it wouldn't last. When the Goddards again could no longer afford to look after Marilyn Monroe, she went to live with Grace's aunt, Anna Lower, who provided her with the most loving and stable home she'd ever had. When Monroe was 15, Doc Goddard got a job in West Virginia and the Goddards couldn't afford to take Monroe with them. But with Lower getting older, they decided she could no longer take care of the now teenage Monroe either. Instead, the Goddards arranged for Monroe to marry their neighbor, 21-year-old James Doherty, when she turned 16. In late 1943, Doherty joined the Merchant Marine and was deployed overseas in 1944. Monroe, who had dropped out of high school, got a job making $20 a week in a defense plant. It was there that a photographer discovered her, igniting her Hollywood ambitions, ambitions that didn't involve being married at 18. She and Doherty divorced in September 1946. Doherty remarried twice and died in 2005. Marilyn Monroe's first show business job was modeling, which served as a stepping stone into the movies. She signed her first movie contract with Fox in 1946 and was dropped in 1947, and signed with Columbia in 1948, but was dropped again later that year. With her acting career proving unstable, Monroe struggled to pay her bills. In 1949, she agreed to pose naked for photographer Tom Kelly in exchange for 50 bucks, which she needed for a car payment. After Monroe's movie career took off the following year, the photos and the merchandise they were printed on became famous. In 1953, aspiring publisher Hugh Hefner bought the rights to one of the photos and made it the first centerfold in his new magazine, Playboy. According to the Washington Post, Monroe later said, I never even received a thank you from all those who made millions off a nude Maryland photograph. She admitted that, despite Fox executives' nerves, her decision to be honest about why she had the photo taken ultimately boosted her career. Hefner's obsession with Monroe continued after her death and his. Although he never once met her, in 1992 he purchased the crypt next to hers for $75,000, which is creepy on pretty much every level. In 1952, retired baseball superstar Joe DiMaggio asked a friend to set him up with Marilyn Monroe. Being the most famous athlete in the country, DiMaggio got his dinner. Monroe had low expectations, but she was pleasantly surprised to find that DiMaggio was reserved and respectful. After engaging in a long-distance romance, on January 14, 1954, Monroe and DiMaggio married at San Francisco City Hall. Monroe later said they were drawn together by a need for stability, but in her mind, that didn't mean she was going to stop working. DiMaggio, however, wanted a housewife and disliked his wife's sex symbol status. These contrasting desires and DiMaggio's possessiveness created tension. 
Alia Kazan, with whom Monroe later had an affair, wrote that she told him DiMaggio struck her often and beat her up several times. In September 1954, after DiMaggio watched Monroe shoot the famous subway grade scene for the seven-year itch, the couple had a fight that turned violent. Monroe filed for divorce, citing mental cruelty as the reason. DiMaggio begged for forgiveness, but Monroe refused. The couple reconnected as friends during the Christmas of 1961. DiMaggio tried to help with her addictions and mental health issues, and later blamed himself for her death. After arranging Monroe's funeral, he had roses delivered to her crypt three times a week for the next 20 years. The widely accepted version of Marilyn Monroe's Rags to Riches story is that she took a few pretty photos and immediately became a movie star. But Monroe worked hard to go from factory worker to Hollywood icon. As a model, Monroe studied her photos and constantly asked photographers for feedback. For five years, she took every job she was offered without complaint, starting as an extra and climbing to bit parts. At Fox, she deliberately befriended studio reporters who were happy to give her a publicity boost. She also made an effort to improve her limited formal education, often reading classic literature on set. Monroe resented being typecast as a dumb blonde or seductress and wanted to prove that she could bring more to a movie than sex appeal. She took many acting classes, first at the Actors Lab in LA and later with famous acting coach Lee Strasberg at the Actors Studio in New York. In 1954, Monroe protested against the demeaning roles Fox kept sending her, as well as the studio's refusal to increase her salary, even though she was its biggest star. After walking out on her contract, Monroe became the second woman ever to found her own production studio, which she named after herself. The rebellion worked, too. Fox raised her salary and gave her greater creative control over her career. Despite her determination to make it in Hollywood, Marilyn Monroe suffered from terrible stage fright. Don Murray, who starred opposite her in 1956's Bus Stop, has revealed that Monroe got so nervous before every scene that she'd break out in a rash. She struggled to learn lines and forgot technical requirements like hitting her mark, walking out of the light, or out of focus. These problems meant that editors often had to patchwork together many takes to form a usable scene. She was frequently also late to set. Murray later told the LA Times, I think it was a lack of confidence. For somebody who the camera loved, she was still terrified. Other collaborators had the same problem. Jack Lemmon, who co-starred alongside Monroe in 1959's Some Like It Hot, recalled that it once took her over 37 takes to finish one simple scene. But he also told an interviewer that he never held this against her, and he knew that she could do scenes in one take because he'd seen her do it. And that the was... next morning we came in and did the whole upper berth scene, that whole first take before he goes down to get the booze, in one. And uh, she had it in the first crack, so you never know. Marilyn Monroe met her third husband, Pulitzer Prize-winning playwright Arthur Miller, on a movie set in 1951. Although each felt an attraction to the other, they didn't act on it until 1955. Monroe had divorced DiMaggio, but Miller was still married at the time. In 1956, during his divorce, Miller was subpoenaed by the House Un-American Activities Committee and risked being blacklisted by Hollywood. Monroe was advised to leave him for the sake of her career, but she refused. On June 29, 1956, eight days after his testimony, they married. There were happier times ahead for the couple, but Monroe ultimately needed more emotional support than Miller could give, and the glamour quickly faded for him. At one point, Monroe found a diary entry Miller had written saying he was, quote, disappointed and embarrassed by her. Miller made his feelings on their relationship public in the screenplay of 1961's The Misfits, which he wrote to give Monroe the chance to show her dramatic skills, while also clearly basing her sweet but neurotic character Roslyn on her personality. The shoot was a disaster, and they divorced shortly after. In the end, Miller didn't even attend Monroe's funeral. In an unpublished essay he began that day, Miller wrote that he didn't want to be around the false people he knew would be there. In 1987, he summed up his feelings toward Monroe. She was a super sensitive instrument, and that's exciting to be around until it starts to self-destruct. Despite her own dysfunctional upbringing, Marilyn Monroe longed to have a child. Unfortunately, she was never able to carry a pregnancy to term. During her marriage to Arthur Miller, she suffered two miscarriages and an ectopic pregnancy. Monroe worried that her alcohol and drug abuse could have caused the problems she experienced with pregnancy. 
However, she also had endometriosis, an extremely painful condition in which the lining of the uterus spreads into other parts of the reproductive system. Some studies have found that endometriosis increases the risk of miscarriage. It was also rumored that Monroe chose to have several abortions throughout her life. This would have been illegal, and therefore unregulated and potentially unsafe, but it wasn't unusual. Hollywood studios had strict clauses about pregnancy and children for their female stars, and a number of legendary actresses chose to have abortions rather than lose their careers and income. It's thought Marilyn Monroe was initially prescribed painkillers for her endometriosis and barbiturates and other sedatives for her insomnia. When she died, her bedside table was covered in bottles of medicines. She also drank heavily. Some of the medication Monroe took was for depression. Many have also tried to diagnose Monroe with a personality disorder, but if she was ever diagnosed with one to her face, she never made it public. It seems fair to say that Monroe's mental health had consistently been up and down, and she attempted suicide at least once in her life. I think you're the saddest girl I ever met. First man never said that. I'm usually told how happy I am. About a month after filing for divorce from Miller, Monroe signed herself into the Payne Whitney Psychiatric Ward in New York, claiming she was suffering from insomnia and simply needed to rest. Instead, she was locked in a padded room and prevented from leaving. Joe DiMaggio, with whom she'd recently reunited, eventually managed to force his way into the hospital and get her released. Marilyn Monroe was found dead by her housekeeper, Eunice Murray, early in the morning of August 5, 1962. The coroner's report concluded that she had died of an overdose of barbiturates and a probable suicide. However, many have refused to accept this as the truth, and the circumstances around Monroe's death have been subject to a number of conspiracy theories over the years. These are fueled by the fact that witness testimonies regarding her death generally contradicted each other. Some say Monroe was in good spirits leading up to her death. She'd been working hard to revamp her image after being fired and then rehired on a movie project. But other people, including her psychiatrist, Dr. Ralph Greenson, said that she was agitated on the day she died. At one point, Eunice Murray, whom Monroe had fired days earlier, claimed that Bobby Kennedy had visited Monroe the day she died, which the FBI investigated and later dismissed. Monroe was barely 36 when she died. The true tragedy of her life is that she was a complicated, fragile, yet determined person who quickly found fame but never quite found true love or stability. If you or anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255.